Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to our Compassion Dialogue, which is hosted by the Spiritual Companions Trust and the UK Register for Spiritual Caregivers. My name is Sohini. And um, this evening, William will be speaking with Paul Gilbert. Towards the end of their conversation, we will have cute time for Q&A. So please send me your questions through the chat box. And um, if you have any issue, any technical difficulties throughout, feel free to reach out in the in the chat box. And um, yes, I'm very I'm very excited about this evening to really hear about compassion, especially given all that's going on on the planet right now. So, and um, so I turn it over to William and to Paul. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a particularly um, relevant conversation, isn't it, today, given um, the situation in Europe. Um, anyway, delighted that we have Paul Gilbert with us this evening for this conversation. Um, Paul doesn't know it, but I, when I looked in my um, Amazon, account Paul and I'm do you, want, do you want to bring Paul onto the screen as well now I'm Scott so it's not just me talking great there you go. Paul what you don't know is that when I looked at my Amazon account I found that I had bought this is now my fourth copy because there are three copies that I've passed on to other people right so um Whatever, wherever this conversation goes this evening, you need to know that I've been a fan of yours for over a decade or so, and have recommended and used you with students and colleagues. And um, yeah, I, four copies of the same book. That's that's uh, that's a lot of people. And I don't think there's any higher um, accolade I can give you. Oh, uh, we can't hear you. We can't we, hear you. Okay, that's very impressive. Really. That's impressive. Yes, that's, that's commission time. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? So they, that, that's, a, and I, you know, I have a. This, this is one of your more recent books, which I have, which has got a great title. Thank you. Yeah, which has got a great title. Anyway, so you're 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 part of my psyche, whether you like, whether you like it or not. Um, so where I'd love to take the conversation today um, is. I want to start with how you, as a child, got interested in this whole topic, what, what was happening to you in your um, family in early years. Um, I know, for example, that you were not born in Europe. Uh, you were born in the Gambia, I think, and that you were, went to boarding school. And there's a whole history there that I'd like you to talk about, share with us, about how that informed you and then took you into the um, domain of compassion and compassion-based therapy. Um, and then we'll talk about compassion-oriented therapy itself, and then a conversation about how do we think and feel in a way that's useful and appropriate in the current wobble that's rippling through um, Europe at any rate and possibly the globe. What, what's the most, is there a path of wisdom we can take here? Um, because there's a whole spectrum of behaviors and attitudes that are possible. And um, let's start with, um, where were you born? How, how, it, what, what happened to you as a kid that set you off on this trajectory? Well, that's a long story. Where was I going? So, <clears throat> and the degree to which those processes affected me is, uh, as you say, quite complicated. You can't always be fully appreciative of what did what to your mind, really. But I, yes, I was born in the Gambia. And my sister was very disappointed because I wasn't black. She said, well, how can we be in Africa and you haven't, I haven't got a black brother? So, um, <clears throat> and we stayed there for a while. Um, and the reason that we were there, uh, which probably is a little bit related, is that my father was in the RAF during the war, and uh, one of those people was severely traumatized, and so he had quite bad trauma, although in those days we didn't really know much about it. So he decided uh, 
but uh, he didn't want to stay in Europe after all the ravages and he would make his fortune in Africa, building roads and building things, opening, you know, so that was, so that was why we're there. And um, <clears throat> we moved around a little bit and then um, we went to Nigeria for a while and I went to school in Nigeria, I went to an American missionary school. So I believe in God, I believe in the Bible. So that was the Texan missionaries. And, uh, but that lasted till I was about uh, 11 years old. And then it became clear that I needed to have further education, at least my parents thought I needed further education. So I came back to the UK and went to boarding school. Did any of that gung-ho Christianity land in you or did you just kind of detach from it completely? Um, it did subsequently. I mean, at the time, um, uh, a little bit, but subsequently I realized that some of it was quite crazy really. Um, the idea about you know Elijah sacrificing his son to prove and all that stuff so but that came when when I became more of a clinical psychologist I suppose realizing that some of the things that are portrayed as re religious are not really it's nonsense and part of the issue of spiritualism is understanding what is wisdom and what isn't just people spouting off basically so that any but but that was quite a strong tradition and um in the the American missionaries were very strong in Africa in the 50s. And they did, you know, they did good things. No, don't, I'm not knocking that. But then I came back to British boarding school and spent um, five, six years there. And that was pretty harsh. And uh, used to get caned a lot because I wasn't a particularly obedient child. Uh, got caught smoking behind the back, you know, all the usual stuff that you... And of course, in now, I think some of it would be regarded as abusive, but um, that's how it was in those days. Um, so after I decided I didn't want to stay in school, I wanted to do my A-levels in a college because this is not now, this is 1968, right? And uh, the Beatles just started up and all that stuff. So I wanted to go to college. So I managed to persuade my parents to release me from boarding school. And I lived with my sister who was five years older than me um, in Portsmouth and um, went to college and joined a rock band. And it's funny things that happen to you along the way, you know, because uh, I loved I loved that life. <laughs> I didn't do very much work, and so after my first year of A levels, I didn't do very well. And um, it, one of the things in life that you realize is that people can have a profound impact on the quality of your life. You know, genuinely compassionate people. So I didn't do very well. So the econ economics um, lecturer. Um, called me in and said, look, these are your papers. To be honest, you failed. And if I fail you, that, that you, you'll be kicked out of here, right? But um, you're a pretty smart person and, you know, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to up your grades this year. Oh. But whatever you do, you do not fail me next year. Do you understand that? And I mean, it was kind of, that, 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 that was a very moving experience for me. And I remember doing a meditation um, many years later in a monastery, and one of the meditations was to meditate on the people that you have gratitude for. And this person popped up in my mind, and I, I was actually quite cheerful, and I remember what he did, because, of course, he could have been lying. I might have done a brilliant paper, but, and he just wanted to make me work harder. I don't know, but I remember that very much, and because I, I would have been, I, I wouldn't be where I am now. Can I, ask, can I ask you one quick question? Yeah, sure. Which is, what did you play in the rock band? I was a guitar player, yeah, I was a guitar yeah, player. Well, got the guitar, as you can see there in the background. Okay, rhythm, bass. Yeah, no, lead guitar player, yeah. Lead guitar player, okay. And um, my voice was so terrible that they would, I had a microphone to sing into, but they would never plug me in. Oh. <laughs> terrible. So that that was very, so they, from, from a spiritual point of view, those were very important things, you're realizing so much of one's life was dependent upon the goodwill of others, really. And um, so then I did economics, and that was interesting because um, I wanted to work in the third world then, as it was then called, but I'd always had this deep interest in psychology, and in the 60s, people said, oh, no, you don't want to do that because you won't make any money, you go and do economics. But luckily, and here's another interesting fact, um, <clears throat> luckily, um, I um, in those days, this is 1973, it was relatively easy to be able to change and do another degree. So I decided I would do another degree 
in psychology. Now, there's only two places in the country where you could do that. Uh, Aston was one, and Sussex, which is quite a famous place where you can do a changeover degree. And I applied to Sussex and um, didn't get in. So, okay, that's fine. And my father, by this time, was living in Dubai. So I, after my degree, I flew out to Dubai and did a little bit of work out there. And then, I think it was about August, whatever, I got a phone call from Sussex to say that somebody had dropped out from this change of a degree course, MSc course, would I like to take up a place? So I said, oh, yes, please. So I flew home, my parents got me a ticket, flew home, and was interviewed and got the place. Subsequently, I discovered that um, I was very lucky because what had happened was the professor of the university was a well-known professor, but he also had a bipolar illness on that day, he was a bit hypermanic. And so they said to him, look, you know, we're short on the course, and he said, oh, let me look at the list of the names. He said, oh, I don't know. We'll have him. He looks okay. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> so that's how I got invited. And then when I got on the course, they, they uh, asked me, well, we were all sitting around doing this as changeover degree, which is very biological. Uh, you know, what did you do? Oh, I did zoology. I did biology. I did physiology. What did you do? Economics. Well, what are you doing here? <laughs> this is supposed to be a changeover degree for, for, for um, you know, biological sciences. Oh, sorry. Um, so the whole thing was very bizarre, and um, so not being very good at physiology, I failed my physiology, so I had to stay another year, and in that year, I worked as a psychiatric nurse at doing night duty on the psychiatric hospital and learned quite a lot about mental health difficulties, and also met my wife playing cricket, and then off we went to Edinburgh to do a PhD in, um, on depression. So that is really my my early life for what it's worth and um lots of different things along the way it's like a billiard ball isn't it you get nudged this way nudged that way and but so many random things you know affect how where you end up and all all your plans are not really straight lines are they They're all a bit zigzaggy yeah but there's but there's a couple of threads that must come together though one you know one of the threads is psychology Another thread is because when we spoke a few weeks ago and I asked you what was your major motivation for the compassion based therapy, you, you up front said rage, rage at social injustice, rage at man's cruelty to man. Um, so presumably that was a thread that was running through you, possibly the fuel for it was increased by the well, the structural violence of a boarding school, the structural violence of Africa, imperialism. I, I don't know what was um, so. There's something, and then you do you go and do the PhD in depression. That's that's. It's, why did you do that as your research topic? I was I was I was fascinated, and of course, um, a couple of things really. Another, another thing which, which is a very vivid memory um, uh, when I was in Africa, my parents, because we lived in the outback, we didn't have any running water or electricity or anything like that. You got your water from the well and you cooked from the stove. Uh, it was, they were nice, you know, um, houses like you see in the movies, really, thatch roofs and all that stuff, but there was no amenities. Anyhow, so my parents were out somewhere and um, a leper called to the house and, um, for money, begging for money. Now they weren't, they were supposed to stay in the leper area, but um, he left, left that and um, he just showed me his hands that are all eaten away with leprosy and everything. I'd never seen anything like that before. And so I rushed around the house trying to find some money. I went into my father's pockets and everything, couldn't find anything and had to come back and said, I'm so sorry. And he just smiled at me and said, that's okay. Or whatever he said, because it was in his language, whatever, whatever and just walked off. And I, that haunted me for a long time. And the thought about how can anybody, how can a body do that? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. how can you live with a body that's been eaten away like that? And that was that was really quite a powerful impact on me. And um, do you so remember how old you were when that happened? Must have been about seven or eight. Yeah, because I think there are these moments that happen in people's lives quite early on, where it's almost as if the heart opens, the compassion consciousness is triggered by. An event like that, where you just look and you go, it shouldn't be like this. Yes, I mean, I think that is a that 
this shouldn't be like this. I mean, that is a very important view I have about organic life, really. There's something gone slightly wrong, <laughs> but that's a, we can talk about that a little later. So that those there were certainly movements while I was in Africa of seeing intense suffering. And then I left uh, as the, um, in 1968, uh, as the Biafran War was kicking off. Was it, no, 63, 63 wasn't 68. I'm talking about that was another reason I was sent back to boarding school because um, the, um, the, the the war in Nigeria was um, starting up. So yeah, so those are those things. And then of course, you know, having parents having come through the Second World War in the way they did, uh, my, both of them had been deeply affected by that. So their mental health wasn't the greatest. Um, so all of those things have a major impact on you, I think, and mm -hmm. you go searching for answers and understandings. But I'd always had a a, a really deep in interest in why people do what they do. Um, uh, and I was very lucky to be able to pursue that interest. What was the approach for your doctoral research when you were looking at depression? What, were you, what was your angle on it? Um, well, in 1975, um, uh, Martin Seligman had come out with a book called Learned Helplessness. So I was very interested in the issues of loss of control and um, and when I went to Edinburgh, I was on a, what is called a medical research council unit, and most of the medical research research was on drugs. So it was all on how the brain works and all the various neuronal pathways that are affected by depression. <laughs> um, uh, and they were they were wonderful. They were all young psychiatrists and young and neurophysiologists and things. But I was of the view that, you know, you could get a lot of changes in the brain as a result of psychological and social factors. Learned helplessness had shown that if people or animals, of course it was done animals to begin with, are subjected to, to things they can't, stresses they can't control, you get these massive changes in brain chemistry and eventually the animal collapses and shuts down. So that was my argument uh, that, um, the, the depressions were really brain states. A lot of them were brain states that were caused by psychological and social processes. They, they weren't necessarily underlying diseases or anything like that. So then my first book was called um, um, Depression from Psychology to Brain State, how you get into brain states through psychological processes. And that really then, because if you ask me what I am, I'm a brain state theorist. I'm interested in what changes are uh, patterns of brain activity psychological and social that not they're not endogenous they're coming from the outside exogenous um so uh and that's what i've been pursuing um what what changes the nature of the brain and it's very clear that um the way we think about things and the way what we imagine has a massive impact on how your brain works you know if you're very hungry and you see a meal um that will stimulate your hypothalamus and then you'll start salivating and the stomach acids will go. But equally, you could just imagine the meal and that imagery will do the same thing to your brain. Or another one we often say is if you see something very sexual on the television, that will stimulate pituitary, get you aroused. But equally, you could just imagine it, couldn't you really? So this is important because when you come into depression, what we find is that what people think and what they imagine tends to be stimulating the stress system. So People can be very self-critical or they can have very negative views of the future. But when they do that, when we do that, we are having this very major impact on our brain chemistry. Equally, and that, I think this is the part you're interested in, if we practice changing to compassion ways of thinking and imagining, this will change the way the brain works. And now we have quite a lot of research all over the world. There's been quite a lot of research showing that if we practice compassion, we stimulate these very powerful pathways in the brain. And, you know, if you think of sexual fantasy, there's nothing strange about that. You know that your fantasies can stimulate your body. You know that, right? But it's the same process. Your compassion imagery can stimulate your body. It can stimulate your brain. And helping people understand that, particularly individuals who are depressed, that if we can teach you how to do this, um, this will help you. That's been my kind of big life journey right back since um all those days ago all right so so i'd love to explore just just a little bit there you are academic psychologist brain stuff and in comes your realization 
that an attitude or thoughts of compassion have an effect on the brain chemistry, the neural networking that then ripples through the psycho neuroendocrinal system. But what, what I'm really curious about is how did you get engaged and interested in compassion as, as a topic in itself, as a domain in itself? Because um, I know you, you've mentioned somewhere that you were interested in Jung's approach. Um, so there's a, 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 a evolutionary archetypal approach to psychology, which is a little bit an outlier in terms of mainstream psychology already. And then compassion, people are often associating that more with a semi-spiritual Buddhist approach to philosophical approach to life. So where did that part of your thinking, feeling, life, how did that, where did that come from? Okay, so once you've got the basic view, then what you think can, you know, what you fantasize, what you practice can affect your, your body. Um, then you're interested in things that will affect your body for good rather than for, for bad, okay? So there are two things, really. Uh, one I, I, we, talked to you, we talked earlier about, which was a personal uh, struggle, um, which was that in 1995, um, I watched a program on the Holocaust. It was one of these um, BBC you know, three-hour things, and they played Gorky's Third Symphony, which is a melancholy for the 20th century. It's a very sad piece of music. And I had young children at the time, um, or not so young, but what were they? It must have been like 10 or something like that. And um, it was just terrific, really. Um, and I was, and I cried through a lot of it, you know, and uh, I was never the same, you know. So I came out of that and I thought, you know, to be emotionally confronted by that, humans are seriously, seriously nuts, really. We are one of the most vicious, nastiest species. We like to think of ourselves as this wonderful species, blah, 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 blah. And we can be, you see, we can be fantastic. We can invent vaccines and all sorts of wonderful things, but we also have a terrible dark side. So that was one of the things I was interested in is how do you address the dark side? And as you know, William, in Buddhism, they talk about it as the mind, the poisons of the mind, the mind poisons, which are the... Um, the opposites, the, the near and the far enemies of compassion, right? So that's, so I got it, I was very interested in that because if we don't address the dark side and it's emerging again, of course, um, in, in the were, were there particular books or teachers that you were reading or attracted to? Yes, a little bit, and you're quite right, Jung, I thought, to talking about archetype or the archetype, the dark archetypes, every archetype has a positive and a negative wing, all of that stuff, the dark hero. Um, so I was very interested with that. and. Later on, um, I got to meet and became very friendly with Anthony Stevens, who was to do, wrote many books on, on archetype um, stuff. Um, so that was one aspect of it that was sort of bubbling away around there. But in terms of therapy, what happened was um, <clears throat> we uh, I, I was trained primarily to begin with, went on this Jungian train of things, but to begin with in cognitive therapy and in cognitive therapy, when people are depressed, you help them to identify a, a, a way of thinking and ruminating and fantasizing, which is driving the depression, okay? So Beck talked about the negative triad, negative view of the self, negative view of the future, negative view of the world. And you, what you would do is you'd help people stand back and come up with alternatives, you know? So people would say, I'm a failure, I'm no good, I'm unlovable. And then say, okay, well, let's have a look at that. And what, how would a friend talk to you? And if you weren't depressed, how would you see this and so on? So that's what you would do. But we, it was known that that would help some people, but not everybody. And some people would say, yes, I know I'm not a failure really, but I still feel like I'm a failure. So anyway, one particular person who I was working with, she'd had a number of suicide attempts and been in and out of hospital. Um, very, very difficult early in life. But she'd made a very good marriage and she had three lovely sons and all kinds of things. And, um, but she still felt she shouldn't have been born because she'd been adopted and things. Um, so we had this idea, I hadn't been born, but then we had this 
series of alternatives, yeah, but I've made a good marriage and I've held down jobs and got three lovely children and they love me and they're doing very well at school and people think I've been a good mother. And uh, she said, yes, I, I guess that's true, but I just can't feel it. You know, I, I know it's true in my head, but I just can't feel it. So I said to her, okay, well, tell me then, can you speak out? How do you, how do you actually hear those alternative thoughts in your mind? You know, how do you, can you speak them out as you hear them? And she said, well, as I actually hear them. And I said, yes. How do you hear them? And she said, okay, come on, you're doing cognitive therapy, aren't you? You got a husband who loves you. You got three wonderful children. <laughs> I said, what? You were that hostile? Yeah, she said, I've got to make myself believe it. I was so stupid. I don't believe this stuff. So I discovered really that a lot of the criticism was being carried in the emotion channel, not in the cognitive channel. And that actually, even when people are trying to be supportive to themselves, the tone of the, the of the mind, the mind tone, the thoughts were pretty hostile. So that was the first shock, really, because nobody told me to check on the tone of people singing. Then the second shock was I said to her, um, oh, well, look, what about if we try and change your tone and you develop a tone that is generally empathic and understanding of the depressions you've had and the deep suicidal feelings and wanting to die and you know, real have a sensitivity to that and come at it from that point of view, how would you be? And she said, oh, God, I'm not doing that. That's pathetic. Why would I want to do that? No, 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 no. I've got to find a way to make myself believe this stuff. I don't want to do any of this flimsy flams. I don't want this kindness. What are you talking about? So she didn't want to do it. So that was a bit of a shock. And then the third shock was that as we did start to work on it, and that was quite difficult. Um, and it was a bit naive on my part, but actually it opened a Pandora's box of real difficult feeling. And the reason for that is because when you start working with compassion, right, you start opening up the caring system, okay? And in fact, it's any motivational system. When, when you open up any motivational system, you will start working with the memories that are in that system. So if you think of the sexual system, for example, if there's been horrible things happen to you, and when you start to open up those feelings, your sexual system, those memories will start to come back. But it's the same with the caring system. So if in your caring system, in your attachment system, you've got memories of abuse or um, neglect or whatever it is, when you start to engage with compassion, that's what that's the system you're going to run into, and you then just release. And so that's what started to happen. She became in touch with quite a lot of rage and an intense, overwhelming, grieving and yearning to be loved. Absolutely, it was quite amazing. And, you know, one, one example I would give you was that talking one day and um, <clears throat> She, she used to get hit and sent to her room with her hairbrush. So she'd be crying. She'd look out at the stars and she would imagine that her biological mother was still there looking for her and that the stars would form a chariot and they'd come and they'd rescue her. So she would be sobbing, this yearning, yearning, if only my mother would come, if only my mother would come. I used to lay in bed yearning for my mother to come. So she was crying. I was crying. The secretary outside was crying. The gardener listening to us. <laughs> oh my God, so sad. So what? we discovered was that when you really work at this level with these individuals actually at the root is this deep 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 yearning to be loved deep yearning to be loved and when you hit hit that i mean the grief that pours out of that can be quite phenomenal and often sitting on top of that is a lot of rage but the problem with rage is that what rage makes you feel is unlovable so those two things are really tricky um, to work with. So compassion focused therapy, that's basically how it started, was recognizing that people, even when they were trying to be helpful to themselves, they couldn't use the caring system, they couldn't develop a caring motivation for themselves, because it was so toxic, that motivational system was so toxic. So we had to sort of clean it up, as it were, detoxify it. And that produced immense amount of grief and rage work. Uh, but when you did it, I mean, it was forever I would obviously going to say this, aren't I? It's uh, it just changes people's lives. Mm. Pause to absorb the uh, story and the implications. That requires from the therapist 
the companion to the person who's going through that process, a, a lot of um, resources in terms of being able to stay present to the situation, hold it, have enough time for it, and have enough time to see it through. Um, so presumably your next issue would have been how do you train people to be able to hold that kind of grief and explosive emotion that they're going to be dealing with. Mm. Yes, yeah, brilliant point, William, because, um, you know, there was also this movement within cognitive therapy to come more and more, you know, do it by the book, as it were. Um, but when you're working with these kinds of clients, and um, I was always at the, that end of the spectrum, I was always at the end of, you know, the clients who hadn't got better with other therapies or drugs or whatever. So that's what CFT was designed for. It was designed for the more tricky cases. Yes, you, you have to help people be able to tolerate and not be rescuers. I mean, you know, one of the problems is if you're trying to rescue people rather than allow them to sail through their own storms, it can be very tricky. So being with rather than doing to uh, becomes very, very important and um, allowing. So when we started this, I... <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what was going on. I just intuitively felt that we needed just to allow the process to unfold and let her find her own way, really. And um, so we went through a period where she would cry a lot and uh, that went on for some weeks, but gradually, gradually that subsided. And, um, and as she dealt with the rage and the grief or the suicide and the uh, attempts but they fell away and we saw a new person emerge. But it is tricky, I agree with you. It's uh, Teaching CFT is, is not easy because you're teaching people a process. It's like teaching them how to paint. You know, Some people are quite good at it, some people are not so good. Um, when, when you engage with caring for someone in that way, facilitating their, their development, you're, you're contracting in to something that may take quite a lot of time. Mm. And the, the NHS ain't going to pay for that. Not now. That is the tragedy, right? It used to, of course. So when we were developing all this stuff in the late 80s and stuff like that, we weren't under anything like the pressures that we are now. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you had the kinds of clients we were seeing, which is accepted that you would be seeing them for quite a long time because therapy was quite short. But, you know, the neoliberal agenda is more for less, more for less, more for less. And uh, unfortunately, therapists who should have stood against that haven't. And uh, so we're, we're in the position that we are now that it's checkbook, checkbook therapy, as they say. But in those days, it wasn't. In those days, we were able to um, develop therapies and allow people to go at a pace where they could go. And we're actually coming back to that now very a little bit. We've just done a study on people with bipolar depression and we... Uh, we had some breaks in it, so it went over for went on for nearly a year. And if you're wanting to change the neurochemistry of the brain, it takes time. You're not going to do it in six weeks. So we're learning now that therapies do need to be longer for certain, not for everybody, uh, but for certain kinds of individuals, particularly those who have high levels of trauma um, and so forth. But they're not short-term therapies. And I think that is gradually being more accepted now. Yeah, there's, there's a there's a not a very benevolent circle here, isn't there? Because you were talking half an hour ago about the social circumstances and the family circumstances that impinge upon the individual to create their mental health problems. And then further along the line, when they want to work on them, there's no resources in order for them to be healed of um, their stuff. Um, it's political, isn't it, as well as? Yeah, it is very, very, very political. And, you know, compassion requires us to be deeply, deeply political. You know, you can't go just sitting in the monasteries and let the world go by. That's not, um, you know, the Dalai Lama is, goes all around the world trying to do these things. So that's a very important point you make. The, the key thing is really, 
the, the problem is epidemiology. You know, if you say if you say you have ten percent of your population have got a mental health problem, say just for the sake of discussion, then if you have a like in in Derbyshire, you've got three hundred three million people. Well, that's three hundred thousand people, right? So the, the 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 pressure is on to see as many people in as quickly as you can, and that just makes psychological sense, doesn't it? You don't want to waste your resources because there are pressures. But the downside of that, or all that is, is that you then are speeding people along in a way that is not helpful um, and it isn't giving them time. So those two pressures, how can we give, you know, use what we have got to as many as we can, that's, that's important. But on the other hand, in the process of doing that, you can so dilute your therapies that actually they're not as effective as they could be. And the question is, is understanding that it is political and people I think need to take a much greater interest in the whole process of how do we distribute the products of our labor? Uh, and that is, that's a big issue, is taxation and distribution of resources. The, it is as simple as that. The, that is the issue, right? And those are the debates that we need to have. What is a compassionate distribution of resources? Okay, so listen, we've, we've named the political issue. Yeah. yeah. We, could, we, we, could hang, we could hang around there and develop it for several lifetimes. Um, just pause there, and I, I know that um, people in this, the network that have joined this evening will, will be interested in, um, before we go on to talk about the Ukraine, um, what, what's your relationship both personally and professionally with Buddhist practice, if, if there is any, because it seems for, for people who are Buddhists, they will, I sometimes notice this kind of sense of ownership of you, right, because it's compassion. Um, but I'm wondering whether that's real for you. Um, well, <laughs> I, I think um, Jung uh, said the worst thing, the worst thing I could ever be would be a Jungian. <laughs> So the ist, why, why do you want to be a Buddhist, right? Uh, because you want to join a club, you want to be associated with that, you want to put on the robes or whatever it does, give you a sense of belonging, sense of identity, all of those things are great, right? But that actually is not the journey. Uh, it'll help you and it's great, but you don't need to be an ist. What the, my understanding um, of this, uh, and I've been involved with it quite a few years, is what the Buddha was very interested in is how you discover your how you discover your own source of enlightenment. So there are things along the way to help you, like pay attention to your mind. So meditation basically means familiarization, get to know your mind. That seems to be whether you're a Buddhist or you're not a Buddhist or whatever you are, that seems to be quite an interesting thing to be doing, right? Uh, and then when you get to know your mind, begin to notice the things in your mind that kind of contribute to the good in you or make you feel better or they don't make you feel better um, and then begin to become aware of motivation and intention so and there are different levels to this you see if you do this the, the deepening level of observing your mind where you allow your mind to settle to settle to settle you become aware that mind itself is itself a mystery it, there are these subtle levels to the nature of mind so you become aware of that if you let the mind settle, you become aware of deeper levels of, of stillness and so forth. So that's kind of interesting. So you don't need to be ist of anything to be able to appreciate the wisdoms of the Buddha and those who have followed him in what they've learned in 2000 years of sitting or paying attention to their mind. They've learned a thing or two about the mind, you know. So that's quite important. So I think the key and what my understanding is what the Buddha was really interested in was not so much a religion, but a psychology, a psychology of liberation, a psychology of enlightenment. Um, that's my understanding. And that's that's how I take it. So yeah, you can just call me a Buddhist. Is that at your end? I just tell him, sorry. Was Buddha calling. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, well, let's stay with this for a second for a bit. In, in terms of a developmental journey then, so where, where does, in your opinion, the human beings, the developmental journey, 
becoming clearer, more observant, more mindful, more compassionate. Where does that go? Does it does it have a a kind of plateau of self actualization like Maslow might suggest? Does it have a plateau of liberation that that certain schools of Buddhism might suggest? Where, where do you stand on all that kind of stuff? Well, for me, and then we talked about it um, previously, is the great mystery that physicists and everybody are interested in is what is consciousness for goodness sake. So there is a whole group of materialists that say, oh, it's just a production of neurons doing fascinating things at high levels of complexity. Well, okay. Well, that's the end of the game for them. So we don't need to bother with them. They might be true, but that's that's we don't need to worry about them because they've already decided it's nothing to it. It's just a chemical trick. But there are other individuals who say, well, I'm not so sure about that. Um, the consciousness is really quite strange, particularly when you start to get into quantum mechanics and all of that really tricky, tricky stuff. So there's something about understanding the interaction between the material world and the, the nature of the consciousness. Now, in the Buddhist position, as you know, they believe that consciousness is what they call the ground of all being. Consciousness is what everything comes from. So in the materialist world, consciousness is created by complex brain but in the buddhist world consciousness is actually it is i mean the dalai lama says it is that which is formless it has no form but it gives rise to form okay so it's empty but it's an emptiness that any possibility can emerge within it so that's i'm fascinated by that and i'm fascinated by these whole concepts about layers of consciousness which um, of course, are unanswerable. <laughs> really. uh, Matthew Ricard says, look, you know, your mind is like water. It can contain or a poison or, or a medicine, but it is neither of those things. And the illusion that we have is we, because the water is clear, you can't, you know, whether, we, we think that we are the poison or we are the medicine. But let, actually, let, let, let me, let me, let me guide, guide us back to the, yeah, sorry, yeah. the question I want to, maybe pin you down on a little bit mm. is the developmental journey of a human being mm. do, do, do you have a philosophy yourself of the possibility that people could be um, I should do a tap, a, a tap dance around the words here um, could be 100% conscious and 100% loving and compassionate which is where the idealism of a Buddhist psychology would take one. It's where the idealism of other spiritual schools would take one, that there's the possibility that a human being can develop in that direction. Now, I know that you think humanity as a whole is capable of um, great, horrible stuff. Do you also have a sense that it's capable of great stuff as well oh yes yes no, no question about it that's the that's the whole point of the struggle of course so the the buddhist and the materialists have very different views about compassion so the materialists say well look you know we have these brain systems that have been evolving over millions of years we can identify certain circuits in the brain there's a hormone called oxytocin you've got a part of your autonomic nervous system called your vagus system and if you practice and develop that you know, you develop your capacity for compassion because you're developing all the physiological systems. That's great. Okay, that's great. Um, but just tell me this. <laughs> but um, the Buddhist position is different from that. The Buddhist position is that if you if you come to compassion through this process of deeper meditation then you realize that everything is part of the same thing. So it's not like you have this compassion or deep love. It's not quite the love that you would experience when you kind of love your child or whatever it is. It's a very different type of awareness that it is, it, it's part of everything, right? So you're part of everything. So everything is part of you, part of everything. So it's like, there is no disconnection. There is nothing to like, there's nothing to love, there is just it. And that, if you follow that thing, gives you this great sense of joyfulness, of connectedness. And there's a lovely story that we often tell 
Um, <clears throat> and the story is a, a typical Buddhist story. There are two waves in the Pacific rushing across from Hawaii towards the Californian coast, because I know Scott's just been in California. And um, there's a big wave and a little wave, and the big wave sees all the cliffs ahead and says, oh no, it's the end of the road. It's just foam ahead, we're gonna be smashed. And the little wave says, no, no, it's okay, we'll be fine. And the big wave says, no, 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 we're not gonna be fine, because it's, it's terrible. All the, all the waves that are going before us are all being smashed. And the little wave says, no, it's fine. And the big wave says, you're only saying that because you can't see what I can see. And the little wave says, yes, but you see, the thing is, you're not water, you're not, you're not a wave, you're water. <laughs> and that's key, isn't it? That what is it that we are? You know, are we flesh and blood? Is that what it is? Okay, well, it's certainly that is part of what we are, and we can create these patterns and in consciousness, we can create conscious experiences of rage and love and hatred and all the rest of it. But is that all that we are then? We're just these productions of uh, these things. Now, my view is I don't think that is all that we are. I think it's much more complicated than that. I think we are water, we're not a wave. But the wave, nevertheless, is what causes the good or the bad. The wave is what will destroy the cliff. So the parts to this is how this consciousness Manif what it manifests and then when you get this recursive conscious you become conscious of being conscious you become conscious of the way of co context then you become capable of intentionality when you become capable of intentionality that changes the whole nature of the game and uh, we're onto a different cycle of consciousness then i don't know if i've explained that very well yeah no no i'm i think we're with you we're with you we're we're, we're, we're the wave and the water the wave and the water and when, when we are both the wave and the water we are a good vibe and it feels great um listen last five ten minutes of us talking and i think we're going to go over time um what's your advice in the context of everything we've been talking about it, yes i'm actually asking you for advice now here, here you are mr elder elder in your field whether you like it or not You're young man <laughs> yes, you are. Very, very, very young very beautiful very handsome very intelligent what's your advice for how people should orient orient themselves towards the ukraine situation especially in in in, in western europe in britain in France and in, in Western Europe, where we're not directly involved, but it's so close that it's we have responsibilities and it's impinged. What's your advice to people in terms of an attitude for this situation? Okay, there are certain uh, there are certain steps that I would say to be aware of. There was a um, um, a monk who'd been captured by the Chinese. And uh, so the, the Dalai Lama was talking to him when he was released, he got out and said, uh, were you ever frightened? And the monk said, yeah, I was. I was frightened that I would lose my compassion for my torturers. And that is one of the things that we need to be careful about because we can be easily caught up in the our own dark side. A dark side will stimulate the dark side in you, right? You will, you know, like Star Wars, you don't know the power of the dark side because it makes us very angry. We want vengeance, you know. They bomb us, we will bomb them. And that's an issue. Um, and so the first thing is to be aware of what is being stimulated in you. Okay, what is being stimulated? And um, just spend some time about that because there's a part of me that, you know, if I had a gun, I'd like to blow his head off. Obviously, you have that feeling, don't you? Um, so that's the first thing is what's being stimulated in us. The second thing is what is stimulated in us, we have to be able to not allow it to become overwhelming because if it becomes overwhelming, then we become ineffective. We can't do anything, right? So yes, so don't let the dark side get to you, right? And stick with your intention. What are your values? Live to your values, whatever your values are. They were yesterday, you live them today as well, right? If there's any way that you can help, then of course, that's what we do. That's straightforward, that's easy, isn't it? Um, so those are sort of some very practical things. It gets a little bit more difficult uh, when it comes to the issue of um, resistance or causing harm. Now, I have a 
colleagues. Uh, well, I, I do a lot of supervision around the world, and we have some colleagues who work with the Russians, and they, they are devastated. I mean, they're just, I mean, he was in tears, you know, because they, they don't want it, a lot of them don't want it, and they're losing their jobs, and Russians getting beaten up in Europe and all kinds of horrible things. So the whole thing is really about how do we hold to the common good? How do we identify not just with the victims fleeing Ukraine, which we must, but also those individuals who are risking being locked up in prison, fighting against the war, you know, risking 15 years in jail, going out on the street. Let us remember and be in contact with the courage of those who are standing against this tyranny. And I think those processes, so that we don't get split and divided, that um, there are forces in the world that do wish to stand against this tyranny, and that's important, and we side with that, and we think about that, and we send our best wishes to the Russian people in standing up against the tyranny, their bravery, their courage, a bit like Gandhi, you know, the same sort of idea. Right? And then the second thing I would ask everybody is, we must start to think about post-Putin. What, what, what is the, how, how are we going to reconcile? We, you know, we've, we've got examples here, like in South Africa, reconciliation. We need to reconcile very, very quickly and not go in for persecuting and punishment and like we did after the First World War. And we had a chance, you know, the, you can follow the history if you want to. Um, when the war, war, we had Khrushchev and the war came down to integrate Russia more into the West, and we chose not to do it. Uh, at least the right wing chose not to do it. Uh, and and we, we as citizens need to know that history. We need to take responsibility to find out why did it all go wrong and take responsibility for that? Because some of the reasons we've got, we are not all, but some of the reasons we are wrong, because we didn't act in the way that we could have acted to ensure that this tyranny didn't emerge in Russia. And the, the history is out there, you can go and find it. So the compassionate position is to be informed, don't get pulled into the dark side, Help wherever you can, of course you can. Try as best as you can not to be overwhelmed by the tragedy, but you will be affected by it, of course you will, and think about the future. What do we want the future to be? What do we want that relation? How can we heal that? Because there's a lot of healing that's going to have to happen. How can we contribute to post-Putin healing? That's what, well, that's what I'm really interested in, uh, talking to some EU people tomorrow. That's got to be, we've got to be thinking about that right now. Mm. And give us one hint of what that post-Putin healing would look like. Well, a lot of it is going to be, I'm so sorry, about this. Um, a lot of it has got to be focused on, um, I nearly always take the phones out this evening and I forgot. Um, a lot of it has got to be thinking about economic reconstruction, yes. you know, like we did after the first World, after the Second World War, we rebuilt Germany and so on. So there's got to be a lot of economic... Kind of Marshall Plan. Yeah, Marshall Plan, very important, something like that. Also, they're not used to the kinds of democracies we are, we've enjoyed, so we've got to support them in democracy. And we're not very good at it, you know. I mean, you look what the mess we made of Afghanistan because of the terrible corruption and so on and so on. So, you know, compassion isn't just sitting down thinking, oh, no, no. it is actually being very, very political. Find out what's happening. Take an interest in politics. Take an interest in what governments are doing on your behalf, on our behalf. And, uh, you know, talk to your representatives and so on and so on. I mean, when the history of Afghanistan is written, the, the the way that it collapsed was partly because of the terrible corruption. I mean, it, it's awful. Um, all that money was pumped into the country, but it didn't actually go to where it should have gone. So uh, this is our responsibility. Okay. Well, what I'm loving is that, and I'm kind of bringing us towards a summary of what we've been doing over the last hour, and then I'll see what, what Sahini has to say to us. What I'm loving is the fact that the rage that you experienced at seven years old with the guy who had leprosy and how that has developed through your life has meant that your whole academic and clinical career has been devoted to initiating and developing a compassionate approach to therapy, compassion-based therapy. And yet at the same time, you're still politically, socially passionate and engage and the two are going hand in hand and I think that's 
anybody who knows me will know that I'm going yay, yay to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sahini, come in. You've been looking at the yeah, chat box. That was what that book, Living Like Crazy, is about, right? Yeah. And uh, the, the compassion is great because it's, you, you know, we've talked about this. The, the two core themes of compassion is courage and wisdom. You know, the courage and wisdom to find the way to live to be helpful, not harmful, to find the way to heal, to find the way to help those around you to flourish, to be in a, you know, to create a world that in maybe a hundred years, it's just great fun to be in this world, right? That's what we work towards. Yeah, and people need to hear that word, courage. Yes, the courage. courage, courage. Rage, rage of the heart, courage. Of the heart, yes. You need to hear that. Sahini, come in. Yes, I'm here, I'm here. Tell, tell I'm us here. Where, where we're at. Should we wind it up or are there any questions well, in the chat box you think we should? Do you think, hang on, let me just pause you for a second. Hmm. Are there any questions in the chat box that you think will add helpfully to the discourse and the flow we're in? The question that most helps, I think, is, is something is twofold. One, somebody asked uh, a question about how do you define compassion, which I just heard you say, courage being part of it. But just, and then what's the difference between compassion and empathy as we look at the Ukraine situation? What's the, where do we draw the lines or how do we straddle? Or is it the same? Okay, it's a great question. So compassion is a motive, okay? All motives have algorithms. An algorithm is an if A, do B, okay? Like uh, you're essentially eating. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, you're, you think of your, your body, right? If the temperature goes very low, you will shiver. If it goes very high, high you'll start. That, that is an algorithm, if A, then B, right? Okay. If there's, if you see a threat, that will stimulate your amygdala to want you to run away. If you see food, that will stimulate your saliva. Okay. If you see something sexual, that will stimulate those bodies. Compassion is when you see distress, that will stimulate this desire to do something about it. If A, then B. And it evolved originally, well, many uh, through, I mean, there's many ways it evolved, but one of the ways it evolved is from the parent. So when the mother sees the distress of the infant, then she's moved to feed it or keep it warm or whatever. So if distress, this activates. So when you see distress, this activates. Where does empathy? So this is a motive. It's a motive. Mm -hmm. And you can you can teach people to be much more sensitive. That's the first part. And then teach them what is courageous action, what is wise action to alleviate. Because not all action is wise. You know, if I see somebody fall into a fast flowing river and I think I must save them. So I jump in but I can't swim and I've got my boots on, um, that stuff. So why is courage and wisdom? Because um, wisdom without courage is ineffective. Mm. Courage without wisdom is reckless, okay? So those are two things. So the, the, the definition of, car, of, of, um, of compassion then is a deep sensitivity to suffering with a commitment and a wish to try to alleviate it. That's, that's motive. Empathy. Empathy is not a motive. Empathy is a skill. Empathy is the ability for us to be in tune with the minds of others, to understand them, to know why you're feeling what you're feeling. Or, you know, if you're a bit grumpy, I realize you're a bit grumpy because maybe you had an argument with somebody else. So this is an intuitive understanding about the mind of another. But empathy can be used for good or bad, right? Mm. The best liars, the best deceivers are empathic. So empathy, because it's a competency, it's an ability, mm. not a motive. Um, empathy depends upon the motive. You can use empathy for good or bad reasons. So when you use empathy in the service of compassion, that really makes you very skilled. It, you, you can still be compassionate. You can still want to help people and not be particularly empathic. Uh, and then you're not terribly skilled. You don't have the wisdom, but you can still want it. Um, mm. Does that help at all? I think so. Well, it helps me a lot. <laughs> I think, that, I think that's, that's a great answer. Yeah. Yes. Compassion is a motive. Yeah. You can do it skillfully or not so skillfully. Empathy is a skill and will yeah. help you to be skillfully compassionate. Okay. You can also be skillfully manipulative as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So mm. this just leads to, to a follow up question or further clarification. How do you be compassionate with yourself in the midst of 
what's going on just in general like how do we use this emotive on our to ourself well the first thing is not to um the first thing is not to be harmful to yourself like you know mm. if you you do you deal with disappointments or setbacks or you make mistakes or whatever it is and of course you're going to be slightly disappointed about that but what can happen for some people is they become very self-critical and then they beat up on themselves and sometimes they even hate themselves or whatever so just become aware that don't release the dark side against yourself so what we what we'd advise you to do is when you have a peaceful moment just think okay let me imagine something i'm critical about now let me just think if I let my critic say exactly what it wants to say, what would it actually say? Go on, critic, tell me what you think. And what would it actually feel about me? And what would it actually want to do? And when you do this, what people are often shocked because what they discover is the critic is pretty vicious. You know, the critic will say things, you're useless, you're crap, you're no good, and I've got nothing but content for you. And I, you, you need to be smacked about to pull out your finger. And so if you realize that actually, the criticism that's doing them harm is all carried in this emotional channel and it's the hostility of the critic right that's yeah. what's doing the damage that's the dark you've released the dark side against yourself so when you then become compassionate you become compassionate to your critic and you say hang on critic hang on hang on what what's going on here you know why are you so vicious what, what are you frightened about and then the critic says well because if you're not, then nobody's gonna love you. You're all gonna be rejected. You're gonna be a nothing. You say, oh, so that's what you're worried about. Then I, I won't be loved, I'll be. So you, then you heal the wounds of your critic. I mean, it, you know, I'm trying to explain a bit of therapy in, in five minutes, but that's basically the process. So you don't yeah. fight with your critic, you heal its wounds because it's, but it can be very, critics can be incredibly vicious. Self-critics can be very vicious. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm cognizant that we're at nine, well, 8.36. So it's a fantastic conversation. I didn't know you were from Gambia. I was raised in Zambia. So, you know, that was kind of fun. And um, all of it's really, thank you. I I feel deeply touched and moved by oh, this conversation. That's great. Thank you very yes. much. So, so what will do now every, every first of all paul thank you thank, thank you, you so much for joining us really great much appreciated